Good morning and welcome to worship this day. So good to see you here on this, in this bright sunshine. Has anybody missed the rain yet? <laughs> Probably a few people are water. Yeah, I see the gardener's hands go up for sure. Well, it is, it is great to see you here. It's great to be joined by those who are at, at home or who may be watching later. All are welcome and we're glad that we can, be, can continue to be uh, connected together. Uh, I invite you to rise as we begin our worship today as we come before the God of truth, confessing and receiving. Blessed be the Holy Trinity, one God who forgives all our sin, whose mercy endures forever. Amen. God of all mercy and consolation, come to the help of your people, turning us from our sin to live for you alone. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit that we may confess our sin, receive your forgiveness, and grow into the fullness of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Most merciful God, we confess that we are captive to sin and cannot free ourselves. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive us, renew us, and lead us so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your holy name. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. As a called and ordained minister of the Church of Christ and by his authority, I therefore declare to you the entire forgiveness of all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Just a closer walk with thee Granted, Jesus is my plea
grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. be with you. Let us pray. 
Lord God, you have placed a plumb line before us, and we find ourselves out of line and disoriented. Upon open us to your word and preaching that we may be trued up, put back in plumb, and renewed by the promise of the person and work of Jesus Christ our Lord, in whom we pray. Amen. I invite you to be seated, kids to come forward at this time, kids at home to gather around. All right. Yes, because I'm not sure that we have any kids in-house today, but I know we have some at home. So I'm going to sit down right here. I think this is going to work. So in our first reading today, we hear about something strange. And it's actually, we're not quite sure what it is in the original Hebrew, but the context tells us that it was one of these suckers, like this. Now, when I was in high school and college for the summer, I used to work on a survey crew, and I would hold a chain that would go way out, and, we'd me- and then I'd hold this over the point and have to be perfectly still. It was quite an art to get it right over. So that was what you, we would use a plumb bob recently. But in the olden days, the only way to get a building straight was to put a weight on a line and hold it like that. We use one of these guys now, right? A level. Let's see if this is level here. Okay, good job, SLC Building Committee. Good job. All right, so it's level. So I can, we can do that. Now, Amos says God puts one of these in the midst of the people. And what God finds out, they're not plumb. And so there's a response to that word from Amos that isn't very good. And then John the Baptist in our gospel reading, and so prepare yourselves. Part of this children's sermon is to, you know, maybe parents might want to have the kids go out during the the gospel reading because it's kind of R-rated violence. But we need to hear about it because John the Baptist put up a plumb line like this to Herod and we, we'll see what happened to John the Baptist. Okay? So we're going to talk about this plumb line. We're going to talk about that today. And so kids at home, anytime you hear plumb line or line or out of kilter or out of plumb or not true, any of those words, write those down. Line, plumb line. See how many times I talk about that today. All right? Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, thank you for your word that is a plumb line for us. And thank you that you have given us the gift that we need as we hear the word today. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And so we'll read about the plumb line from Amos this morning, the seventh chapter. This is what the Lord God showed me. The Lord was standing beside a wall built with a plumb line, with a plumb line in his hand. And the Lord said to me, Amos, what do you see? And I said, a plumb line. And then the Lord said, see, I am setting a plumb line in the midst of my people Israel. I will never again pass them by. The high places of Isaac shall be made desolate, and the sanctuaries of Israel shall be laid waste. And I shall rise against the house of Jeroboam with the sword. Then Amaziah, the priest of Bethel, said to King Jeroboam of Israel, saying, Amos, has conspired against you in the very center of the house of Israel. The land is not able to bear all of his words. So thus Amos has said, Jeroboam Jeroboam shall die by the sword, and Israel must go into exile away from his land. And Amaziah said to, to Amos, O seer, go flee away to the land of Judah, Earn your bread there and prophesy there, but never again prophesy at Bethel, for it is the king's sanctuary, and it is the temple of the kingdom. Then Amos answered Amaziah, I am no prophet, nor a prophet's son, but I am a herdsman 
and a dresser of sycamore trees. And the Lord took me from following my flock, and the Lord said to me, Go, prophesy to my people Israel. The word of the Lord. morning comes from the book of Isaiah, the first chapter. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord and Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual gift in the heavenly places, just as he chose us in Christ before the foundation of the world to be holy and blameless before him in love. He destined us for adoption as his children through Jesus Christ, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace that he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and insight, he has made known to us the mystery of his will, according to his good pleasure that he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to gather up all things in him, things in heaven and things on earth. In Christ, we have also obtained an inheritance, having been destined according to the purpose of him who accomplishes all things according to his counsel and will so that we, who were the first to set our hope on Christ, might live for the praise of his glory. In him you also, when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and had believed in him, were marked with the seal of the promised spirit. This is the pledge of our inheritance, through redemption as Christ's own people, to the praise of his glory. The word of the Lord. The 
Gospel according to Mark, the sixth chapter. King Herod heard of the Gospel's preaching, for Jesus' name had become known, and some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead. And for all of this, for these reasons, these powers are at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it is a prophet, like the one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John and bound him and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, though, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers and officers and for the leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter, Herodias, came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guest. And the king said to the girl, Ask me whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he solemnly swore to her, whatever you ask of me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. She went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? The mother replied, the head of John the baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the baptizer on a platter. The king, the king was deeply grieved. Yet, out of regard for his oaths and for the guests, he did not want to refuse her. So he immediately sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison and brought his head on a platter and gave it to the girl. And then the girl gave it to her mother. And when his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in a tomb. The Gospel of the Lord. Thank you, Betty. Sometimes when you say the Gospel of the Lord doesn't always fit. But there is good news in the midst of all that. Gracious God, let the words of my mouth, the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight and be fruitful for our walk in you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. The plumb line, the standard, Today in our scripture readings, we have the sublime and the sordid. Two scripture readings, Amos and our gospel reading from Mark, sandwich some of the most beautiful words in all of scripture, a long sentence about the good news. But the sandwich, the bookends of that good news is pretty sordid. We've got Amos on one side and Herod on the other. We've got Amos in the northern kingdom on one side and then Herod and all of his political machinations going on on the other. And there's a confrontation that happens in our scripture reading today. As the word comes to us, God's standard and human standards. So on the one side, let's talk about Amos really quick. Amos is speaking to the northern kingdom. This is a time in the history of Israel when you've got um, a divided kingdom, 
And so basically, Amos is a prophet that's been told to go and preach to the king of the northern kingdom, and that's who you're hearing about. And they had, be at this time in their history, were quite wealthy, at least the power elite were, um, the rulers were. And they, Amos, if you read the whole book, will say that you've abused your wealth, you haven't taken care of the vulnerable and the poor in your land, and God's judgment is coming. There's a plumb line that Amos holds up to the northern kingdom. And they're doing all kinds of horrible things, and they are not measuring up. Well, then what does John the Baptist do with Herod? Now, this is Herod's, the great, one of his sons. He killed a lot of, Herod the Great killed a lot of his children when he thought that they were a threat. But these are, once Herod the Great dies, his kingdom is divided up into four sections, and this is Herod Antipas down in Jerusalem area. Philip is a brother of his, and Herod Antipas had divorced his own wife and married his brother's wife. And John the Baptist says, and he holds up God's standard, the plumb line. Now Herod is interesting character, Herod Antipas. He likes to listen to John. He has almost a, some kind of spot in his heart for John. He knows he needs to arrest him and, and shut him up. But now, in this banquet, he gets swept up with ego and arrogance and makes a promise that, that he'll regret, and he does, and so he ends up killing John the Baptist, who held up the plumb line. Going back to Amos, what, do, what does the king and what does the high priest say to Amos? Get out of town. Go down there to the south and preach to them. Get out of town. So, when we see the plumb line held up of God's standard, God's justice and righteousness, in both these examples, there is no repentance, but the exact opposite, an effort to silence the plumb line, to get it out of sight, to get rid of it. And that is one way that human beings respond to that standard is they get rid of it one way or the other. The conviction is so strong they'll stoop to murder sometimes. Interesting. Now if you look at the whole sweep of Scripture, and you might even say, wow, God's judgment on the northern kingdom was pretty harsh because what does God say? Well, you're going to you're going to go off into exile. You're going to be swept away. That seems kind of harsh, maybe. But note, it only happens after they didn't repent. What would have happened if the northern kingdom and the high priest and the king would have said, oh, you're right, and rent their clothes and put on ashes and sackcloth, that sign of repentance, and, and returned to God and God's righteousness and justice and, and tried to you know, align with that plumb line of God. What would have happened? I don't know. In the book of Judges, you have this cycle. The people go into idolatry, they err, God's judgment comes, and then they repent, you know, the, the consequences come. Then they repent and God restores them, and you have this flow. But here, no, no repentance. Herod takes care of John the Baptist. Some things are more important to Herod than God's plumb line. So, here's the first thing I'd like to point out to us today with this, with this plumb line. Here in our church, all Christian churches probably this is true of, but especially true in our church where we begin every Sunday, we deal with the plumb line differently. We deal with it by confessing our sins, not denying it. We say the way to deal with it is first a sense of repentance, a sense that, wow, we have missed the mark, we are out of plumb, we are out of line, we are not true. But let's talk about today. Is there a plumb line today for us? 
Is there a plumb line in the church? Last week we talked about the right-hand kingdom and the left-hand kingdom of God and how God works through civic world and then God also works through the gospel and the preaching of the word in the right-hand kingdom. But is there a plumb line on both of those sides? You know, it used to be in our society that the Ten Commandments was kind of one way to sum up the plumb line. If you've ever been to the Supreme Court, anybody ever been to the Supreme Court in Washington, D.C.? Who sits right above the justices? Moses. And the Ten Commandments. But all the other systems of jurisprudence, all the other plumb lines from many religions and many philosophies are all around that top of the Supreme Court. The interesting thing today, and I'm not going to go way down this as a rabbit hole, and, and I thought I might have got myself in trouble last week. I'd really get myself in trouble if I went too far on this one this week. But it's interesting in a democracy, which is also a republic, right, that can, the, can human beings just decide what the plumb line is? Hey, if you get enough people to vote, does that make it right? I don't know. But it's interesting, but so then we had a republic that goes along with that democracy that says we have certain standards, plumb, a plumb line, that is not human of human origin, but is, has a transcendent referent. That's a fancy word. That, in other words, this is true, and this came to us. We didn't invent it. And it's interesting, when you have that, then that makes it more of a stable plumb line. Now, I wasn't sure where I'd say this in the sermon, but I'll say it here. There's always a process of trying to take, whether it's the Ten Commandments or any standard, God's plumb line that was spoken and given so long ago in an ancient culture, now long a date. There is work that we have to do to rightly apply that to modern times. I am not a what some people would call a fundamentalist, etc. But I do worry when we lose the grounding of a transcendent referent for our plumb line. Because then you've got chaos. Whatever else anybody, you know, happens to say. And I think in the left-hand kingdom, we're wrestling with that as the culture. But that's not really why you came here, and that's not why I got up here to talk about that. I want to talk about the plumb line that we live with each and every day in our lives. Everyone deals with the plumb line. Everybody. There's no escaping it. I would call it the tyranny of the plumb line. You know, Martin Luther said, as you've often heard us talk about, that whatever your heart and trust itself, I say, is your God. Well, everybody has a plumb line, whether it's religious-based or not. Everybody has a standard, a set of expectations for themselves and others. And so one way, another way that we can deal with this plumb line in our lives is just to work harder. You can deny it, you can kill it, you can push, silence it, you can shut it up, you can get rid of it somehow. Or a lot of people just say, well, I'm going to work harder and harder and harder to measure up to that plumb line. I'm going to do better. <laughs> but it isn't always, the plumb line is not always simply rules and regulations or a set of standards or ethics. I can, let's talk about teenagers. Let's talk about the social media world that our kids are growing up in and that now we live in and that many of us kind of grew up in. What is their plumb line? It's what other people think. It's what their peers think. It's what clothes they wear, what they say, who they hang out with, what their Twitter feed looks like, how many likes they have on their Facebook or, well, they don't do Facebook, but on, on whatever, new social media, Tinder, whatever, how many likes they have. And it is oppressive, and it is a plumb line. It's something by which they measure their worth. And it's scary. But just coming to church this morning, as I was listening to the radio, I was listening to an article on COVID-19 survivors. 
And one of the biggest psychological in things, which is interesting because I wouldn't have necessarily thought of this, but now that I've thought about it for a few seconds, it makes perfect sense. There's a big thing about survivor guilt for COVID-19 people who've had COVID-19, especially those who were really sick, especially those who were in the more vulnerable population, especially those who went on the respirator for months and then survived, but others didn't. And there's something called survivor guilt. I survived. Why me, not somebody else? Hello, plumb line. Our combat veterans know this well. Why did my brother, why did my sister today survive and not survive, and why did I survive? That's a plumb line. So how do we deal with it? Well, we can work harder sometimes. In fact, that was in this radio story, what was said is some of the survivors are dealing with their survivor guilt by trying to do more kind things and good things for other people in honor of those who didn't make it. And, I, and that's cool. I think that's great. But still, that's a tyranny of that plumb line. I'm glad they're doing that. In fact, let me just, you know, Let's switch metaphors here a little bit, watching my time here. So some of you know that I took a real last-minute trip to Phoenix. How many of you know, heard about that? My, oh, look at that. You're plugged into my social media. Woo-hoo! I got lots of likes. <laughs> woo So I've, as I've talked about many, a lot, but just enough to keep the new f- folks in, informed, my mom and dad's sports apparel business, little mom and pop shop, got the Phoenix Suns first contract. She designed their logo and designed their original uniforms, and we did that for 20 years. So we had this huge attachment in our family to the Phoenix Suns. And some of you, and I have to admit that I've kind of checked out of NBA basketball for quite a long time, but of course with the Suns now being in the finals, Hello, um, and we don't have a basketball team here in Seattle, so we're f- it's fine. I can talk about this. Um, so anyway, so they're in the final, so I get plugged in, and so I took a whirlwind trip to Phoenix and watched and got to go to the game two, and it was an exciting game. But there was a moment in that game that, if you happen to watch it on TV, that really struck me when it comes to the sermon today in this plumb line. DeAndre Aiden is the Suns really star, one of their three probably best players, center that they drafted a few years ago. He's a young kid. He's 21 or something like that. Just a kid. And he's had a great series. He's done wonderful. But at that game, he almost couldn't catch the ball. And the Milwaukee Bucks center whose name, Giannis is his first name. I can't say his last name. He's from Greece. It's very long. And so he was really having his way with him. And you could see DeAndre getting more down and more down the whole game. And, he, and it just, you could just see that it, he, there was a plumb line that he was not measuring up to, and it was crushing him. So there's a moment where the coach of the Suns... Um, who I'm so impressed with, um, Monty Williams, sits down in the chair, come over here, sits down in the chair and grabs DeAndre's hands, and he's talking to him, and DeAndre has got his head down like this. And so Coach Williams says, look, look, here's, this is the deal. Get back in transition. If you don't have Giannis, find a man and be a guard. Okay, that's basketball technical stuff. And then he says to him, look at me. Look at me. You set a high level for yourself. That's why you're down. That's great. Now go reach that level, okay? And you can reach it with force. It doesn't have to be stats all the time. Go dominate the game with force. Because you've set a high level for yourself. Go dominate the game with force. And he sent him out. And DeAndre Aiden, in the last four minutes, made a difference in that game. Now, there's one thing I really like about what Monty said to his center. And then one thing I'd like to change for us in our Christian walk. 
It was the perfect thing to say to a center on a basketball court. And that is, work hard, forget about the stats, forget about the results. And I would tell every parent who's listening that when it comes to your kids and the plumb line of grades and standards, reward them for working hard and not for the results. You keep rewarding them for the results, straight A's, and you're just gonna raise up kids who are perfectionists, who anytime they don't measure up are gonna be completely depressed. And believe me, the universities and everything, it's, it's the standards are oppressive for our young people today. Sick oppressive, in my humble view. Reward them for, get out there and work hard. That's what Monte Williams said when he said, you know, you know, go out and dominate with force. In other words, go out and dominate with effort. But then he said, you can do that. But what Monty couldn't say to him, that I get to say to you, is that the way to deal with the plumb line is not with your force, not by trying harder, not by shutting up or changing the plumb line, not by getting rid of the standard, but by going to the cross. The Apostle Paul beautifully says it in the midst of our two readings today. This is what he says. And An Annika, if you can bring up that other slide now, that's perfect. Paul says, in him, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us. I love that verb, lavish. I mean, just think of lavishing, just getting soaked in God's grace. That's the plumb line. That's what trues us up. That's how to deal with the plumb line. Yes, get out there and work hard. Let justice roll down like waters, but in Christ, justice did roll down and washed over us all, his righteousness. Hey, when you're feeling survivor guilt or you haven't measured up, you go back to God's plumb line, Christ Jesus our Lord and his cross. Amen.
Let us sing a song to God with the whole church as we confess our faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us join our hearts together as we pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, as we pray for the whole world, everywhere, according to their need. O oh God, our world so often seems a place of uncertainty, corruption, and deception. We pray that your truth, your life, your justice would be revealed in the midst of all the noise. Help us to seek and to listen for where you are calling and set us right when we go astray. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, we pray for your healing presence among us. We pray for those continuing to sift through the rubble in Florida and for all the families mourning and waiting. We pray for many affected by extreme heat and pray for restoration of sea life in our region, for all who experience loss and fear because of international conflicts. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, enliven those who gather today for our picnic at Luther Haven. Give energy and creativity to those who make final preparations for Vacation Bible School and all church camp. Lead us to a deeper appreciation of the gift of community as we continue to gather. Lord, in your mercy. Hear our prayers. Lord God, we lift up Audrey Ebeling and her family, all of us, in the death of Dieter. We pray that you would wrap your arms around them and continue to hold them up. We pray for Peggy Grigg. We pray for Regina Cloninger in hospice care. We lift up Kristen Shiplett as she's suffering through a miscarriage, and certainly her husband there as well. We pray for Julie Enabo as she is suffering from severe sciatic pain. We pray for those who are recovering from surgery and illness, for Jerry and Mark, Darlene, Nancy, Ben, and Dave. We lift up those who are dealing with cancer, Letty, Harold, David, Dave, Betty, John, Julie, Melanie, Jim, Elizabeth, Dave, Ron, and Carol. 
We pray for those who are deployed at this time and for their families here at home, for Jillian, Christian, Andrew, Daniel, Austin, Bradley, Rebecca, Megan, Jared, and David. There are many for whom we continue to pray and others who we name before you now. Sam, Jamie, Malachi, Connie. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in the mercy, the love, the grace that you have shown through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please share that peace with one another. As we share those signs of peace with one another, important blessed time of our service, I want to just share a few things with you uh, in our community time. First of all, again, for those at home, uh, we especially ask that you would uh, use that QR code or go to our website and use that Connect card to let us know that you're here worshiping with us, um, whether it's right now or later today or sometime this week. We'd love to know that you're connected. Also a great place for prayer concerns sharing feedback, that kind of thing. Um, and then also, uh, it's, uh, it's um, sorry, one of the best ways, of course, to connect with us, to keep in contact, to, to stay in touch is through our app. A lot of things are on there. We have other social media platforms where we offer things, but that's kind of the one stop shopping for sure. And then a, a few announcements this morning. Uh, we do have two memorial services that are coming up that we want to let you know about. Kathy Glick on July 31st, and then Dieter Ebling's service will be on August 7th, and those are both going to be at 1 p.m. Um, we'll have those out, that information out, but that's uh, Kathy Glick on the 31st and Dieter Ebling a week later on the 7th at 1 p.m. VBS set and ready to go. There's still some room, but the four-year-olds now have a waiting list. We have a waiting list for that class um, if you have uh, kids that you know, um, grandkids, kids, friends, neighbors, get them signed up soon. That is really filling up, and it's really exciting. We had a gathering uh, to kind of, and kind of training yesterday, talking about the theme, getting some energy going behind that. It's really going to be just super well done. So um, church picnic is today. There is a 75-person limit, and it says on my announcements we have a few spaces left, but I, from talking to folks today, I, that's all filled up for our picnic today. I just wanted to say, you may be wondering, well, well, wait, wait, we have open worship here. Why do we have a limit on the picnic? That's, that's kind of the Luther Haven rules at this time, and they're, they're continuing to review that. We have a great volunteer board, but that's the rules for Luther Haven is for organized activities. It's a 75-person limit. I want to take the opportunity, though, to tell you that if you want to go out to Luther Haven at some point, they have a 50-person uh, limit per day, and you can sign up on their website. It's very easy to do but they do require that you sign up for that at this time. Um, if you want more details, you can call our office or you can get a hold of the, of the folks uh, administering out there, the caretaker out there. And then la next week, we're gonna have a brunch for uh, Cottage Bay Apartments, a connection that we have through the school over there, Esquire Hills. We've had a great connection. I gotta tell you, I gotta tell you, my wife works there. And it used to be, you know, kind of like there's a little bit of caution, like when you're working with different community organizations, and sometimes there's a little caution working with the church. 
And now over there, it's like, hey, what are we going to do together? There's, there's this fluid partnership that we've established. And I thank all of you for your generosity towards that, many for you for volunteering financially, uh, physically, uh, for, for our community connector, Kathy Bowman, who's done just great work over there. It's really a great connection that we have with one of our schools, and it's, it's, it's just amazing to see. Okay, I'll stop there. All right, well, this is the time in worship where as a response to the grace of God, we give our offerings. Uh, we are not uh, passing the plates yet, but there is a plate there if you have a out in the, in the entry if you have a physical offering, and then I'll, always through the app or other electronic giving, you can do that as well. All right, let us continue with our worship by giving thanks for those gifts offered today. Please rise. God of abundance, we bring before you fresh fruits of your creation, and with them our very lives. Lead us to joy and connect with and care for all those who need until the coming of your Son, our Savior and Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Remember now how in the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And how again after supper he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this in remembrance of me. We remember our Lord Jesus and his gift to us as we pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. The gifts of God are ready for you, God's people. I invite you to be seated and come forward as you're invited.
communion process. We'll just remind you about what that is. So when you come forward, you'll receive a piece of bread, or there's also a gluten-free wafer if you need that. Um, you can use intinction and dip it in either of the two chalices. The dark is the wine, the light is the grape juice, or if you'd like, you may eat the bread and then receive the wine via a small cup and just simply point to that and let your server know that.
I invite you to rise as you're able. <clears throat> May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the gifts of his body and blood strengthen, keep, and unite us now and forever. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, we give you thanks that you have nourished us with this feast, the body and blood of your Son. By your Spirit, multiply this gift in us so that we may give ourselves away as bread for the hungry through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Before our benediction today, I just want to note, uh, we're going to give a blessing for this uh, communion box that's being sent uh, with Barb Smithson to Clara Barr. But I want you to know, too, that there are lots of folks as we've been coming up, even throughout this COVID, that are like, I need an extra because I'm going to see, I'm going to see. It's an amazing ministry, and let us bless it in this way, but also kind of globally in this congregation. Loving God, we do give you thanks that you are not contained in this place, but that you are out loose in the world and your grace is everywhere. And so we give thanks for Barb as she takes this meal to Clara and for many others as they take this, your gift of presence to those who, are, who cannot be with us in this place. And so bless it, all of it, in Jesus' name, amen.
are grace-filled and spirit-led. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.